so Thank much you. for Thank you so much for joining us for those in person. The owls sitting in front of you are going to just watch you as you move a little bit. We'll mute during the presentation, but I always like to make people aware of that. But for everyone that is virtually here, thank you so much for joining us today for our first uh, NVCOG Learn to Use Lunch and Learn. I am Savannah Nicole Vialba. I'm the Senior Regional Planner for Housing and Integrated Development, which is just a funky way of saying I do land use and I do housing. And so ultimately, the NVCOG is working on expanding the ways in which our land use division supports you as planners, supports you as commissioners, and supports our communities on the very necessary topic of land use. And so today, we're going to be starting with a presentation from Becky Bradley. She's the executive director of the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission. She gave us a wonderful presentation at the uh, Regional Planning Commission, which is another entity that our organization um, takes part in. And we have Kurt as a member of our Regional Planning Commission. And so ultimately, Becky's going to run through a presentation today, going to give us some information about planning for warehousing and distribution uses. There'll be time for questions at the end. And then we will hold something for our land use staff in our region at a later point to debrief. So if you are from the North Tech Valley region, you're one of our municipalities, please pay attention and look out for an email for me so we can continue this conversation. And for those outside our region, thank you for joining us and, and we're happy to have you here as well. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to Becky. Thank you very much for that introduction and for uh, having uh, me back uh, to, to talk to you guys more about uh, freight and land use. Um, it has turned into a real uh, necessity here, but also gone beyond that and is now a, a really strong area of focus and to some degree a labor of love for our group at the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission. Um, is it possible for me to share screen? Yes, you should be able to. Should be able to. Okay. It does not like my PowerPoint. Give me one second here. Let me try this again. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So um, I am the executive director at the Lee Valley Planning Commission, um, and I'm also the voting member and the secretary of the Lehigh Valley Transportation Study. So um, just a little bit about where we are and what we do is we're in the Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton area of Pennsylvania. So just north of Philly and just uh, southwest of the New York Metro. In fact, we're adjacent uh, to the New York Metro and the Philly Metro. Um, so we really are sort of a gateway between uh, those two larger metros as well as points west. And that's why we are one of the fastest growing corridors in the nation for warehousing and logistics. Um, and right now, our gross domestic product is uh, actually over $47 billion uh, annually. So that's larger just in the two-county region of the Lehigh Valley, the Allentown and Bethlehem area Again, just uh, it, it's larger than the entire state of Alaska um, and the entire state of Vermont for context. So um, that's just what's coming out of economic uh, output here in our region. We are the 69th largest region uh, in the U.S. as well for context. So um, I kind of put together a, a quick little thing because we're both part of a really important collaborative effort called the Metropolitan Area Planning Forum, uh, which is a mega regional partnership, as many of you already know, uh, to work on issues specifically around transportation and our roles as metropolitan planning organizations. Um, and the MAP Forum, which we we call ourselves for short, has almost 26 million people. Um, it has very specific challenges, as you're all aware. Um, and I wanted to note, too, that we're 
equidistant from Wall Street. And that's important because um, Wall Street is the center of commerce in America, but also for the world, because commodities are traded by the US dollar. So we contribute and work on things that affect not only the national economy related to our mutual uh, to our regions and our proximity to market to the Northeast United States. But what goes through our communities in Connecticut, uh, down in North Jersey, in New York State, and then over into Pennsylvania, into the Lehigh Valley, all of that also supports a portion of the world economy. So kind of understanding the context of that and the fact that there's this partnership, at least on transportation issues, that we can learn from each other share ideas and information, I think is critical to our global success and something I know um, we're all mutually uh, proud of. So my agency does not sound too dissimilar from yours. Um, we are a bi-county planning commission under a series of uh, state and federal laws, including bi-state uh, compacts for water withdrawal and other things. But we see every subdivision and land development plan every municipal ordinance, uh, comprehensive plan, multi-municipal comprehensive plan, those sorts of things. In some cases, we're advisory. In some cases, we're regulatory. So it's a bit confusing. Um, but similarly to uh, when uh, the host introduced me and she said, uh, that's a long term for I'm a housing planner uh, and a land use planner. We have similar situation uh, here where we're all doing a lot of really fun and unique things. And because the size of your agency and our agency are what they are, and the size of our regions are very similar, uh, it really allows us to operate more like speed boats versus tankers that are hard to turn. Um, and so I think that's where um, advantages to both NVCOG and Lehigh Valley Planning Commission are important in managing things like freight because you have people that know a lot of things. You have local communities that are already collaborating, working together well through a series of regulatory and collaborative systems beyond the MAP forum. And then we're also the MPO. So everybody works for both, but everyone just calls us the LVPC. So one of the things that we do uh, is we always, we have a set of principles. Um, we call them our pillars of, uh, a pillars of management, really, but it's a philosophy that our whole organization operates under, and that's to always start with fact-based optimism, especially because of the changing political environment, um, which seems to be a blade of grass these days, and us being in a squarely purple area, um, it's very important to take the drama out of the conversation because we're all dealing with very compound complex issues. So we always look at what are the trends, where do things stand now, and then how does that relate to the future? So uh, right now, um, we're a little over almost 650, uh, excuse me, 687,000 uh, people. And we've been growing in population steady since 1960 at a rate of about 4,000 uh, residents uh, per year. And that's been fairly consistent as seen on, on the slide. Um, and we predict that to continue. So we're really going from a squarely medium-sized region into a medium-large region. And then when you hit that million person threshold, you really become what they call a major metro. And you're competing competing in a whole nother arena with cities like New York, uh, Newark, and, and other things. Um, so what's been happening in the Lehigh Valley and how might that affect you? So because we have that land use component, we track uh, development proposals uh, very uh, ruthlessly for, with, without a better term to describe it. So um, we've reviewed more than 22 million square feet Last year, that was the most ever in a single year, um, and 18 million square feet of that was for industrial. Um, of course, that was most of it, and roughly 17.5 million was, uh, we, we reviewed 18 million square feet of industrial, and roughly 17.5 million of that 18 million was warehouse, e-commerce, three parts. A 3PL third party logistics uh, space, um, and then had a, about a half a million square feet there of uh, manufacturing, which at this point I could teach a PhD class on, but you, you need more storage than you do 
manufacturing space because manufacturing has become a lot more efficient. But those two uses are very much related to each other. So um, people ask why here? I mentioned proximity to Wall Street, but also something that's critical, which I believe could be affecting you as well, but you would know that better than I would. Um, during Sandy, uh, Hurricane Sandy, um, the port of New York and New Jersey was wiped out. Uh, they lost the grocery store chains alone that had a lot of their storage, especially cold storage, didn't have electricity for well over a week and lost millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of product, cold, refrigerated, frozen goods, that sorts of things. They were the ones that um, initially started moving into an area that was um, less out of the coastal zone. So they started coming over into Pennsylvania, at least on the the, the warehouse storage and logistics side of the coin. We've always been a, a manufacturing um, center as well. So those are some of the things that started to drive it. And then it became things like uh, national security related things like data backups and, and other things for um, the New York Metro that's started coming in. But then uh, manufacturing that we already had began to grow, and then that started attracting more manufacturing. Um, our vacancy rate is below 5%. Of course, we monitor the economics of development very closely because that will help us predict uh, if what we're reviewing is actually going to move forward how quickly it's going to move forward, um, and then also monitor things so like our existing building stock and whether um, that's being utilized, abandoned, maintained, redeveloped, and those sorts of things. And that's, a, I think, an important function um, that, that we have is a county planning agency that supports the work of the MPO. So honing a little bit more on industrial, um, while it's true that warehouse industrial like dominated uh, non-residential square footage, even with all that population growth and things that people need uh, when they move into an area, you can really see from this bar graph. I showed you what was proposed on the first slide. Um, this uh, bar chart shows you what was approved by our local governments here, who um, in all cases have the final say on land developments. We're recommending body on the land development side. They're the final approval authority. Um, so you can see out of all of those proposals and what's really been happening here um, since uh, 2017, prior to the pandemic, so really the last three years, that our municipalities, even though so much is being proposed, um, they've approved about 4.4 million square feet of uh, manufacturing, mineral extraction, general industrial in the past six years, and then another 22.5 million square feet of warehouse e-commerce and logistics over that same time period. So when we compare municipal approvals to the proposals that the LVPC has viewed uh, through 2022, um, with we could have a lot more coming with the potential of at least another 21.5 million square feet of just e-commerce, warehouse, and logistics, and a little over 1 million square feet of general industrial mineral extraction manufacturing space. Um, just uh, two Fridays ago, we received a set of plans that is three and a half feet tall for nine um, industrial buildings totaling uh, over 8 million square feet. If that gives you an indication of the type of growth that we're seeing. And, and that was out of a, a single a single development. Um, so we're really, really having to change how we think about things. I mentioned before that we follow the money and this gets back to the facts and the fact-based optimism and really managing what's happening. Um, Specific industrial and land use demand in the Lehigh Valley is made up largely of food manufacturers, um, third-party logistics companies, and e-commerce companies. So uh, um, all of Sam Adams beer outside of the small brewery in Boston is manufactured in the Lehigh Valley. All your ocean spray, cranberry juice, um, the craisins are an outfall of that so they don't have to pay toxic waste disposal fees um, are coming out of here. But there's a lot of, uh, because we have a major aquifer as well and, and we're, we have too much water, uh, that supports that industry in particular. A lot of medical device manufacturing uh, as well. Olympus uh, cameras, which is a largely medical device company, B. Braun, um, Air Products, which is a commercial gas manufacturer, Fortune 500 uh, company, and, and real innovator uh, in uh, the, the, the um, 
the commercial gas sector, as well as were the uh, home of Mack trucks and Crayola crayons. Um, which were both uh, invented here. So we've got a lot going on, traditional, new, and then expansions of uh, things. So then you throw in our proximity to market and all those people in the Northeast and then a gateway to points West um, and then to the South, even into the DC Metro. And you see that there's a perfect mix of manufacturing and distribution. So that's really fed all of this. And this gets back to following the money and being able to explain that to our communities who um, in some cases have been overwhelmed by the growth that they're seeing, in other cases, no. So um, in the aggregate, the industrial sector pays a little over $6.74 per square foot per year, um, and that's really up from $5 per square foot two years ago. So they're getting $1.74 per square foot per year more. Um, so that's obviously driving the investment. So for a 500,000 square foot facility, which is an average uh, building size that we see for an industrial um, uh, that's $3.37 million per year. So on average length of a, a lease term, which is is only eight years. Uh, so there's a whole host of land use implications behind that. But really that yields about $26.9 million rent in eight years. I mean, if you use this across an average of the 141 million square feet of industrial region wide that exists today, uh, the private sector industrial property owners uh, combined are earning an estimated, um, you know, four oh, over uh, nine hundred and fifty um, point three million dollars uh, per year region wide, um, and then over the length of that lease, that's two in in total. That's uh, seven point six billion dollars in in rent. Uh, across that the life of all of those leases. So you see the economy there, um, and why that's so important. Okay. So we're also tracking what's happening around the country and how we fit into that. Um, so we are the fastest growing industrial market in the nation, uh, according to Transwestern, which is an industrial, um, an industrial growth inventory over the past year and projection, projection for future inventory growth is the highest in the nation um, at 6% and 6.3% respectively. So no other region comes close. The next two highest regions for new industrial product are Dallas and Houston, but their rates are about 3.4%. So ours is over 3% higher. Um, so, um, or, or 2% higher. And that's a difference between these large Texas metros and the Lehigh Valley. And so that again, tracks the investment. And comparisons are really important because what this has done, all this industrial growth over the last six, seven years has put us in um, what the uh, the real estate sector is saying, the commercial real estate sector is saying is a tier one market. Um, but we're starting to run out of space, which is why uh, areas that have similar metrics to what we do, which you have some, uh, should expect some uh, industrial growth as, as well. So we got to find solutions to these uh, global challenges. They really are global. Um, they aren't just controlled by us, but we only have the tools that the state and the federal governments and our counties give to us as an agency. So how can we work with those? We do have 62 local governments that we're the county planning agency for, uh, 17 school districts and 16 water and sewer authorities or watershed uh, districts. So that sheer volume of industrial has created some really, really interesting conversations. Since we've been monitoring the form, the footprint of the buildings through our county planning work, it became obvious that not only were we just getting a lot of big square box industrial that's infinitely flexible and that's very attractive to the, the commercial development sector because it's flexible, because they can get different types of tenants, whether it's e-commerce or manufacturing or combinations thereof. But we also started to see the dawn of the high cube automated warehouse, which we call the dark box. What these are, 
is there in this case this one um in the the image is is a 12 story americold cold storage warehouse um in uh Rochelle Illinois because when we started to to see these being proposed we were like well, what is this where do they exist what's going on in the market so we started doing a lot of of research um and developed a very quick community guide which you can find on our web website to help our local governments figure out how to regulate these types of uses, what the traffic generation would be. And we use ITE manual, just like probably you do um, in your shop to uh, understand uh, what types of uses generate what type of traffic. Um, and we were starting to see that the impact of these skyscrapers of goods, essentially, which are much taller than the average building in an average suburban community in the Lehigh Valley, you'll only see 12 story buildings in, in Allentown. You won't see them in Bethlehem and you won't see them in Easton, uh, our other two uh, primary cities. So um, we knew that we're going from fire departments that uh, don't have equipment that can fight a fire uh, over five stories to now having to talk to them about what do you do um, when you now have a 10 to 12 story um, warehouse logistics facility uh, that's moving high volumes of product in a very efficient way using robots and not people yet has a truck profile that can be though not always in excess of a traditional e-commerce facility or traditional manufacturing facility and so we knew we needed to get that word out so we set up a whole series of things which we've continued uh to do through the pandemic and are actually um they had to go online during the pandemic and we're we're trying to move some things online and in person now i'm sure you guys are wrestling this this as well we have a series of things that we do um planning and pizza data and donuts transformative talks do all kinds of stuff and invite uh, the public in but they're specifically tailored towards our local governments that then have to regulate in this space here's just an example of the it trip generation that we put together um, so we created a scenario that we used to talk to communities about, um, looked at the land use code in that ITE manual, and then created an average daily rate of trips. We're working with our local governments to then connect that to their zoning definitions so it makes it a lot clearer and that they just don't have one giant general industrial anything can happen here folks and then get caught in a scenario where not only can there be other land use implications but some of these larger ones associated with industrial like traffic uh, become uh, our emergency management services become a lot more difficult um, and then the quality of life um, and ability to even to business uh, roads. We don't want people investing here. And I think this is an important communications with your private sector partners, the development community and users of these facilities. We don't want people investing here and their investment to be bad. If you are going to invest here, your investment needs to be supported. Um, and that requires all of us to work together because if your investment is good, and our investment in you is uh, equal to that, we'll all be successful. So what does that mean? Uh, we do not incentivize nowhere, no how, and we get mad when the state tries to do it. We don't give any handouts. None of our local governments do. Um, we don't, we just don't, we don't need to incentivize something that's already coming at us like a waterfall. So instead, our investment is through negotiations, finding locations where these facilities can go and be successful, uh, working through regulatory requirements to make it uh, as green as possible, meet broader resiliency, carbon reduction goals, and other things that we have set for ourselves. That's our investment in the community now and into the future. Um, and so we have to quantify that as well. And that gets back to the fact-based optimism. Uh, we have recently, because our growth has been so strong, seen our neighbors starting to get a lot of that growth uh, around us in eastern Pennsylvania. We formed the Eastern Pennsylvania Freight Alliance. We're now doing a 10-county uh, freight um, 
uh, transportation or freight infrastructure plan separate from the land use conversations because we're seeing truck movements um, all over the place, uh, different demand for rail service uh, and air service as well, because freight is inherently intermodal and the majority of it will move on truck. Um, or box truck or other things. So um, just a quick example on that, because this is something I don't think a lot of people really understand. We'll go out in the communities and they'll say, well, why can't we just put it all, all on rail and only put the industrial, zone it only along the rail lines? Okay, well, rail takes longer to move. Um, it's often more costly unless you're moving things that can move slowly and are very heavy, like riprap materials for the cement industry or cars or other things of that nature. Rail is very good for that, and that's what the industry uses it for. Um, if we demand everything in two days or even same day, um, you have to move it around as efficiently as possible. And then when you're talking about the fact that most things, um, especially consumer goods, have a, a global footprint, you may have uh, something that starts in a factory in India. Um, it's moved uh, from that factory by a vehicle to a port. It's on a ship. Uh, it makes its way to whatever port. In our case, it's likely the port of New York and New Jersey. Um, it's probably a similar scenario for you. Once it leaves the port, it's probably leaving on tractor trailer, going to a DC or distribution center. It's sitting there until somebody orders it. Um, then it's going uh, potentially on another tractor trailer to another DC because you may live in Chicago, um, or it's going on to a delivery van. Um, it could be being moved in a box truck to USPS to be delivered delivered by your postal um, uh, person. And so things move so many different ways. We really have to accept the fact that it's inherently multimodal and plan for all of it. So we've been really working with our Eastern PA Freight Alliance to get a handle on that because now we're starting to see really weird truck movements on rural roads and other things trying to get from one region to the next. Um, and that's causing all kinds of bridge collapse issues and other real serious externalities. And we wanna try to avoid those. Um, we did wrap up at the end of last year a Northampton County freight-based land use guide with our one county, because we're a two county region, and we're doing the same for Lehigh County um, now, which is the county to the west. What that is, is we actually, as the county planning agency, analyzed all 38 local government zoning codes, created an online interactive map of those, took it out to the local governments and said, Here's your vulnerabilities, folks. Now, what are we going to do about it? So um, after the shock and awe of, of that uh, subsided, we really got down to business and what tools were available uh, for them to utilize and kind of created a choose your own adventure freight based uh, land use guide. And that uh, is already starting to pay off. We just got that done at the end of the year. We're now starting to see zoning ordinance amendments um, and communities starting to put together the required committee under state law to create tra tra traffic impact fees and other things. Um, that uh, tool and the guide is available through the Northampton County website. Um, I'm not sure what I'm looking like on time, but I can show you the, the, the zoning thing if you would like, um, if we have a minute. But the other thing that I really wanted to talk about is now as MPOs, we're all required to work on carbon reduction. Well, how do we do that? And we've started to think through the new funds that are coming in, um, which are also coming to, into all of you as an MPO and what that may look like. So we've been going along our highway corridors and saying, what's green? What's our potential for carbon sequestration? What other benefits does that have? Is it beautification? Can we quantify how much carbon we're taking out of the atmosphere? And then we really realized out of this image, this aerial that we worked with the uh, uh, Weitzman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania and their landscape architecture program on was, okay, we do have have a lot of green assets next to our highway infrastructure. However, we don't own that. So what do we own and what can we leverage through these new carbon reduction uh, funds that are coming to us to accomplish the goals that are required of us and that we want for ourselves and our future as a region 
And so we really realized in that moment that our public rights of way are our best assets. So how can we manage those, especially with all of our freight uh, or majority of our freight, over 90% of it being moved around on trucks? And while things are becoming more efficient, it's not becoming um, or less polluting. Um, it's not happening fast enough. So we are going through a process. We'll be using some of those carbon reduction funds for planning. Uh, we're going through that right now with the uh, long range transportation plan update that we're doing to uh, allocate a portion of those to actually do a green infrastructure plan utilizing existing highway rights of way. So recapturing those scrubby spaces and stuff that gets filled with trash uh, in a, a larger beautification effort. We've also been working with our local governments in a similar effort on how can we leverage the space in between these warehouses. I know it's a little hard to see um, is opportunities for um, recreation, floodplain protection and the like. Uh, and again, I mentioned we're uh, updating our long range transportation plan right now. So many amazing and exciting things are coming at us as metropolitan planning organizations. So how do we maintain that future forward look uh, that we need while incorporating all of these changes, which seem to be happening, everything all at once, but not nearly as exciting as the movie. Um, so we've been working with the public. We just wrapped up a transportation needs a survey. I felt this was very important. Um, and I know the team really enjoyed doing this as well. We had a thousand survey responses, which is a very high response rate. It puts us in a margin of error of a little over 3% um, for statistical validity on how would people spend the new highway infrastructure money and what does that mean for land use? And so we put that out in English, uh, in Spanish, offered um, Arabic and Mandarin translations as we needed it, and actually went out and had 27 public meetings in a span of 30 days. Um, because one of the other things that we learned in our last long range transportation plan update, because remember that was only four years ago and this industrial stuff was really starting to churn and pick up at that time, is many of our small local governments did not have the capacity to fill out a complicated form asking questions about cost and project limits. And um, many of them didn't even know what right-of-way acquisition was. And so we learned from that process last time that communities with means, a higher income, higher educational attainment, a lot of our suburban uh, communities could put in 10, 12 project um, requests to our long range transportation plan, but communities that sometimes needed it the most, the cities are our, our boroughs, which are many cities, um, they didn't necessarily have the capacity um, or their projects uh, may not have been as well formed. So taking the time that month to go out to them and say, we're just going to sit here with you and fill out the form and then go back to the office and cost it out. And we developed a cost model with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation that would get us an accurate assessment is really helping us create a better plan to start to chip away at some of these issues uh, of freight, but also community need and equity um, in a different way. And I'm hoping a more successful way. Uh, another thing I mentioned, we are doing a lot of education through planning of pizzas and other things, but we've been leveraging those local uh, local technical assistance program funds that come through USDOT down to the states, partnered up with PennDOT um, in our LTAP program, and aren't just doing uh, class um, training for our public works officials. We've branched that out now to what we call tech assists. So there, it's an on-call service where any community can call us. One of our transportation planners will go out with a PennDOT engineer, um, work with the local government on whatever the issue is. They're often pedestrian um, situations, ADA accessibility, could be stormwater management, other things. We issue a report then, and then that gives them priority uh, for funding, whether that be through our MPO and our regional allocation or through the state. 
so there's ways to start to try to manage the relationships between trucks and people and multimodalism um, using the collaborative approach that all of us share as MPOs um, in land use agencies. We started the General Assembly about four years ago, believe it or not. Um, our Bi-County Planning Commission is a 37-member commission apported, uh, appointed by both counties um, with representatives from sub-regions around the Lehigh Valley. But we realized that county councils, um, all the local governments, the school districts, our federal and state elected officials, weren't really talking to each other and the general assembly which is a twice a year meeting was a great way for us to understand and build a common um, vocabulary and direction for the way we needed to go as government partners that's been successful um and then the other thing that we've been doing is partnering with the Pennsylvania Municipal Planning Education Institute to train people on our state planning law. Um, and we've been training a lot of folks because we know that our local governments are made up of volunteer zoning hearing board members and volunteer planning commission members that take the job because they care about the community. Um, they're not paid. And they need to know how to process the applications that are in front of them, but they also need to know what regional trends are available. So we were able to work um, with our planning institute, which is supported by our Pennsylvania planning, uh, Pennsylvania chapter of the American Planning Association, to start to get folks at the local levels muscles built to address these deals of uh, address these issues of growth um, more. Um, professionally. Uh, and then we also uh, created a program where you become a certified citizen planner if you take three of our four classes. So that's everything from the 101 on planning, which we call community planning, to uh, zoning administration. Becky, this uh, is really great. In the last five minutes, can you show the municipal guides that you created? A lot of our audience today are municipal land use staff and municipal commissioners. So I think that that, that would be really great to go over with them in our, our last bit. Okay. So um, we also really quickly uh, do a lot of urban design work and we pay through that through PL funds through our MPO work where we actually figure out how to work with historic communities and other things and visualize how you can create those multimodal conditions, um, serve transit, and make the system work. The visualizations are priceless. Uh, and I would encourage uh, you guys to invest in that if you can. And I'm going to switch over here. Um, let me know, did that display the website? OK. Yes. Good. Um, and I believe that John has the copy of the PowerPoint as well, which has the link in it. Again, we did the first part of this with Northampton County. It's on their web page. Um, we uh, even have a recorded training program if you want to watch uh, watch that. And the community guide is here as well. Um, the analysis tool really quickly is fantastic. You could do this for your own town. You don't necessarily need, you know, to do a major, um, a major look, uh, look at everything if if that's not practical. But it's just an ArcGIS online uh, story map, um, and so you can look at where different uses are, and we made them translucent so you could see the net effect of zoning ordinances. And when you turn all of those on, you really realize that the vast majority of Northampton County by our local governments is zoned for industrial uses. So if you want to match that up to your infrastructure, uh, you need to do that in a way that those uses can be supported. So if you're up here in Moore Township, which is uh, along the Blue Mountain where the Appalachian Trail runs, it's largely rural, probably having the majority of your township uh, zoned for general industrial is a really bad idea because trucks can't get to it. Um, in and out of it, and it creates all sorts of other externalities, competition with the agricultural economy and other things. So we use this to talk through uh, that with our local government. And then the land use guide. Uh, again, uh, we created it as more of a choose your own adventure, uh, which describes how to use the map if you need uh, any help with that. 
again, all the links are through the county's website. Um, sorry, I know the scrolling on a uh, presentation could be a little bit annoying, but we did take a lot of time to craft some specific example definitions for zoning codes. So what's the difference between a distribution center and a fulfillment center and IQ warehouse uh, and what all of that means so they could have more specific regulations. And you see we have quite a few of them here. Uh, differences between small and large warehouses and how those should be regulated. Again, the freight land use tool, which I showed you, which is the analysis tool. Um, we did actually partner up with U.S. Green Building Council. They're called Green Building United here to do a sustainable series of three sustainable warehouse forms as well to help improve the, um, the building envelopes themselves when working with communities. Uh, we did find examples of different communities and highlighted things that were good examples for other communities to use. So your considerations, again, gets gets back to your, your choose your own adventure and giving real life um, things that could help folks. Talking about things like setbacks, buffer areas, landscaping, other things, if when industrial does come into town, how you can regulate that. Um, and what makes sense based on the type of use. So you, you get the idea. We went pretty far um, uh, in depth on what, what that is and even looked at neighboring state of New Jersey, which has stricter planning laws in Pennsylvania. We're a right to develop state. They're a right not to develop state is the, the joke um, between uh, our two, two um, communities. But we go into all kinds of traffic impact fees and others. But you see it's fairly substantial driver amenities, facility amenities. That's important because uh, oftentimes um, things happen where our local governments um, don't think about the drivers themselves that are key to moving pro uh, products. And even the end users, the industrial um, operators don't think about that. And so we don't want trucks sitting at the side of the road, those dr drivers having no place to go to the bathroom or to put their trash. They're not allowed on the site uh, before their delivery time. They're pushed off the site after that. They all have electronic truck logging devices. They can only drive so many hours a day. So how do you build that into the land development so you don't have those externalities? So we spend a lot of time on that uh, as well. But I encourage you to poke uh, through all of that. And I'll stop at that point and see if anybody has uh, any questions. You'll send us the link, right? Yes, we have the link. So we'll send the presentation to everyone who's here and registered. We'll also specifically send that document. So thank you so much, Becky. I think that's going to be really useful in our region. Any questions from the audience here? No. Any questions from the virtual audience? My friends on the interweb. Uh, interweb. <laughs> yes, there's Kyle Chiel. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Becky, question on the, on the map. When you're putting that map together and the vulnerabilities for the communities, was it, I don't know how Pennsylvania is, but Connecticut, each town has different categories. It's not apples to apples for the zoning layer. Was, there, was that pulled together with the state office where it's all relatively easy to pull together or are you kind of tediously going town by town to pull the zoning layer together? State office, what state office? Um, no, we do, We because we have to review every zoning ordinance anyway, we have copies of them. So we went through the tedium of categorizing all 38 communities zoning codes into those categories. Um, and, and it did take a lot of time. We hadn't done that before in that way. So um, it took one of our GIS people about three weeks solid, but it was spread out across probably about six weeks uh, to build it. And that's another reason why we did one county first and we're doing the second uh, next because it it's it's a big lift, but it's a worthy one to understand um, where we have not only vulnerabilities, but opportunities. That methodology and the guides, we're doing a similar exercise here in the capital region. I'd like to, so if, if I could connect with someone on your staff and geek out with them on the methodology, that'd be great. Our chief planner, his name is Steve Naratko. Um, he is uh, the lead on that and he'll be happy to talk to you. I'm going to drop his uh, email in the chat for you. Great, thank you. Any other questions?
All righty. Hearing none, Becky, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everyone who attended virtually. We really appreciate it. With that, we'll sign off on the Zoom. So goodbye to everyone in that world.